J'appelle à la tribune M. Kofi Annan, président de The Elders, président de la Fondation Kofi Annan, ancien secrétaire général des Nations Unies. Monsieur le Président de la République, <coughs> Votre Altesse, Anne Uk Tanran, Votre Sainteté, Votre Éminence, Vos Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, si vous vous permettez, je vais vous parler en anglais. I am deeply honored to join you today at the Summit of Conscience, which comes just a few months ahead of the UN Climate Summit here in Paris. Allow me, Mr. President, to warmly commend you, as well as His Majesty and the leadership you had, for the leadership you have demonstrated on the existential use of our time. The real and present danger of climate change is not anything that we can underestimate. A few months ago, I was greatly blessed by the birth of a third grandchild. His arrival caused me to reflect on the world as I have known it and how it may look by the time he reaches my age. And I'm 77. Of course, today that is considered middle age. <laughs> and it, is, it was a sobering moment. I know, that it is, I know that if action is not taken immediately to stop and reverse current climate trends. My grandson will live in a world where the average global temperature could be several degrees higher than when I was a child. The result will be suffocating heat waves, severe droughts, disastrous floods, and devastating wildfires. Entire regions would experience catastrophic decline in food production. Glaciers and ice sheets would disappear, leading to rising sea levels, drowning cities such as New York or Venice and small island states. This brings to mind what Nikita Khrushchev once said when reflecting the impact of potential nuclear war. The living would envy the dead. We are close to reaching the tipping point beyond which man-made climate change risks denying my grandson and his generation of the right to a healthy and sustainable planet. This is not science fiction, but it is not too late to take action. Climate change is a challenge which can and should be confronted. The history of humanity is a story of ingenuity when faced with grave threats. We already have successes and successful stories to inspire us. In the 1980s, when satellite photographs revealed a massive hole in the ozone layer, the nations of the world came together and took a swift and decisive action. Thanks to the adoption of the Montreal Protocol in 18, 1987, which phased out ozone-depleting substances, humanity avoided the worst. We found better ways to power our fridges, and air conditioners. We invented aerosols that were less harmful. 
we used fiscal measures in rich countries and development aid for the poorer ones to help make the transition possible. Scientists now confirm that the giant hole in the world's uh, ozone layer is slowly recovering. So change can happen, provided there is a political will to push for it. I am heartened to see that relatively few people today question the science of climate change. There are some, but they are becoming fewer and fewer thanks in large part to the work of IPCC. But for COP21 to succeed here in Paris, we must go beyond science. We, we have to secure a global consensus with realistic targets for emissions control. So I welcome the commitment of the G7 to make deep cuts in emissions and to gradually phase out fossil fuels. I hope all countries, all countries will come to Paris in November with similar intentions. We must adopt action policies to decouple economic growth from the ever greater use of coal, oil, gas, and ensure a faster shift to renewable energy sources. This will require carbon pricing, and phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. However, as was the case with Montreal Protocol, the wealthier countries must provide financial resources and technologies to aid poorer countries to cut emissions and adapt to the impact of climate change. Specifically, Developed countries must deliver on their commitment to mobilize annually, to mobilize annually $100 billion for the Green Climate Fund by 2020. We must not forget that Africa can and has to be part of the solution to climate change. Africa is already experiencing the damaging impact of climate change, yet no region has done less to contribute to global warming than Africa. In 2012, Sub-Saharan Africa without South Africa emitted only 2% of the total global greenhouses and green gas emissions. If left unchecked, climate change will turn vast areas of uh, productive land in Africa into dust bowls, creating widespread hunger and mass displacement of rural populations. Increased competition over arable land and fresh water is already creating conflict amongst local communities and provoking tensions between states. But by tapping into its vast potential for renewable energy, Africa can boost economic growth, create jobs, and avoid the high carbon pathway that has brought the world to the brink of catastrophe. I want to stress, however, that the solution to the climate crisis in Africa and elsewhere cannot be left to governments alone. It requires the active participation of individuals, civil society, and business. Thankfully, we are seeing promising examples of such leadership. Companies are shifting away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and are driving research, innovation, and investment to facilitate the transition to green economy. Six of Europe's largest oil and gas companies have recently called on governments to introduce global carbon pricing system. Major airlines are investing in environmentally friendly fuels generated from farm waste and animal fats. The successful Autolib electric car sharing scheme here 
in Paris is another example of how the private sector can develop green alternatives and contribute to cutting air pollution. Civil society groups are launching worldwide campaigns for climate justice and putting pressure on businesses and governments to meet their responsibilities. And as individuals, we can support these efforts through our own actions. Each of us can, for example, use energy efficient light bulbs, power down our electric devices, and recycle waste. It may not seem much, like much, but it adds up. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, climate change is the ultimate, most emblematic challenge in this age of globalization. For the sake of our grandchildren, we cannot ignore that challenge. We have the duty to bequeath to them a world where all of mankind lives in peace and harmony with nature. As an African proverb says, the earth is not ours. It is a treasure we hold in trust for our children and grandchildren. We must be worthy of that trust. Let us develop a global conscience based on well-being of our planet that transcends national boundaries or group and self-interest. Every nation and every individual working together must strive to defeat the threat of global warming. We can succeed, but it would require sustained and determined leadership. And here we may find what John F. Kennedy has advised once, especially relevant. He said, and I quote, by defining our goals more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it, end of quote. And allow me to conclude by reminding us that when leaders fail to lead, the people will lead and make them follow. The people will lead and make them follow. Look around you. The signs are all around us, from country to country. People are taking the lead and demanding change. In good conscience, we must not fail them. Thank you very much.